Okay, so in Madrid, Spain, and uh, well, first of all, I want uh, to thank you all of you to attend this webinar and also the organizing committee to invite me to, to present today for the in a working group to and um, as you know the goal of this uh, webinar are focused on the uh, imaging and uh, we really want uh, to display how different imaging techniques uh, they benefit uh, as patient monitoring so These are my disclosures. And uh, the question we want to answer today is what's wrong with 2D radiation fraction in Is anyone else having a hard time hearing Teresa? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just sent her a message. At the beginning, as we all know, before we went live, her connection was great. Um, and she was on her phone Wi-Fi. I'm just asking her if she's on the same. It might have accidentally switched to another Wi-Fi. Because um, okay. it was good before. Now it's yeah, now it's very bad. The information we receive probably is not enough in some clinical scenarios like patient with FF or amyloidosis or if we want to diagnose a stage 3 heart failure in cancer patient. And of course we have a lot of evidence that ejection fraction is a good uh, pronostic marker but um, uh, when the question is about to follow up of left ventricular function and we detect an impairment of ejection fraction, probably strain help us as a pronostic tool, but it's not always essential. But on the opposite, when the question is about uh, the follow up of left ventricular dysfunction or the question is about uh, uh, the quantification of left ventricular function and we detect a preserved ejection fraction, if we only use ejection fraction, we uh, are not able to assess in deep the phenotyping of this patient, which is essential to develop uh, targeted treatment strategies. And in cardio-oncology, as Dr. Liu nicely reviewed in the previous imaging working group webinar, GLS represents a more sensitive and reproducible marker of left ventricular function to guide a cancer therapy-related cardiac dysfunction diagnosis, but also monitoring or prevention. So next question is, what's wrong with ejection fraction in cardio-oncology for uh, the clinical point of view? And uh, for that purpose, I wanted to share or to present uh, you two uh, short clinical cases. These are two women with breast cancer. Their baseline ejection fraction uh, were the same, but um, the follow-up was completely different. Patient number one was able to receive a complete breast cancer treatment with no cardiovascular events or side effect at one year follow-up, but patient two develops heart failure uh, symptoms mm -hmm. uh, early during the cancer treatment. And of course, if we use in this uh, latest uh, advanced imaging, we can improve baseline risk stratification and uh, we can reclassify the risk for future uh, cardiovascular toxicities. And in fact, when we detect a decrease in GLS at baseline, we know that these patients are at increased risk of cardiovascular toxicity or heart failure during a treatment with anthracycline. However, 
3D ECHO and GLS are not always available in daily practice. And uh, these techniques uh, also have their own limitation regarding expertise or availability. So, in addition, we also need to consider other restrictions for the use of 3D ECHO or strain in cardio oncology imposed by COVID. And uh, this is a recent report from um, Jack. And uh, after analyzing uh, the evolution of um, imaging testing in the different cohort of patients, authors conclude uh, that uh, um, during the last year, uh, transthoracic echo volumes have decreased by 59%. And without any doubt, these numbers also affect uh, cancer patients. But for transthoracic three D echo strain are not the only tools that we have to stratify cardiovascular toxicity risk, because we know that uh, cardiovascular toxicity risk depends on several factors, and the frequency of cardiovascular problems is higher in aging or in those with pre-existing cardiovascular diseases, cardiovascular risk factor, or previous cancer treatment. And therefore, to perform a comprehensive cardiovascular evaluation at baseline, we need to include all these parameters, of course, we need also to include the action fraction and probably strain. That is not the only parameters that we need to consider at baseline. So in case we do not have a viability to quantify through the echo or to quantify strain, we can also do a good, a good job with this patient. And if we review the clinical characteristic of these two cases from baseline evaluation, we and can understand that uh, patient number two is at higher risk of cardiovascular toxicity because of previous cardiovascular risk factor, because of age, because of a different cancer treatment. And in addition, the ECG reveals 11 circular blood cancer block, which is not a normal finding for um, this patient. So uh, to combine all these uh, parameters is the strategy proposed by the Cardio-Oncology Working Group of the Heart Failure Association and ICOS using this baseline risk assessment performance. And uh, the aim of this performance is uh, to categorize uh, the risk for future cardiovascular events in patients treated with different types of uh, anti-cancer drugs. So probably the question is not what's wrong with the action fraction in cardio-oncology, that's uh, how to integrate multimodality imaging in cardio-oncology to uh, be able to improve the cardiovascular care of our patient. And um, this is very important because we need an answer that will work uh, in large number of patients with uh, different cardiotoxicity profile, but also with uh, different expected risk uh, during cancer therapy. And um, once uh, we uh, perform the baseline evaluation of uh, this uh, cardiovascular toxicity risk is, one, is once we are able to optimize the cardiovascular monitoring, because if we uh, uh, remind our previous two patients, patient number one is at low risk of cardiovascular diseases, so probably we need a baseline evaluation and also an echo evaluation in during the first year after a cancer treatment, but say patient number two is at least at medium or even at higher risk of cardiovascular problems, so we need to perform a more close evaluation during the cancer treatment. And uh, cardiovascular evaluation is not only done using ECHO, of course, we know that ECHO is the method of choice to assess cardiac function in cancer patients, but uh, CMR, cardiac CT, nuclear imaging, PET, stress mm -hmm. ECHO, are also very useful tools in more complex scenarios in patients with myocarditis or when we need to rule out coronary artery disease or when we need to organize the follow-up of patients with valvular or pericardial uh, diseases. And um, 
uh, before to start uh, reviewing some cases uh, that uh, will focus on that topic to select the right tool for the right patient in, in cardio oncology, I wanted to recommend you this um, free uh, recent review that uh, focus on the usefulness, usefulness of stress echo, cardiac CT, and uh, magnetic resonance in cardio oncology. And uh, I hope that uh, you find uh, this article very helpful in order to uh, organize uh, your daily activity in uh, in cardio oncology. So uh, my first case um, is um, about uh, a 57 year old man with past history of uh, diabetes. He has a diagnosis of multiple myeloma a few years ago and he was treated initially with vortezomib and dexamethasone followed by autologous stem cell transplant. And he also received lenalidomide for two years to uh, achieve or achieving a, a complete remission. Uh, in 2017, he develops a symptomatic progression and um, a treatment with carfitomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone was planned. And uh, the vision is doing well at the beginning. In fact, uh, his baseline echo was normal, ejection fraction, ELS, even right ventricular function was uh, completely normal. But uh, after the age of uh, this treatment, he developed short of breath with exertion and he was referred to the cardio oncology clinic. So when we receive the patient, blood pressure is uh, higher than normal. 170 over 98, the CG shows a sinus tachycardia, and uh, the, the patient uh, has uh, signs of a heart failure with uh, mild peripheral edema and also an increase in NT probium. So this is uh, his echo. And um, as you can see, uh, it seems that uh, the left ventricle was not dilated, ejection fraction was normal, but uh, we found a significant decrease in the strain uh, when we compare with the baseline and also a minor the decrease in right ventricular strain. So do not have much information about how to use strain in patients treated with carfitomib, and in fact, there is not a specific recommendation on how we need to follow these patients with ECHO. And um, after this initial evaluation, we performed the diagnosis of HFF, uh, and uh, the patient was treated with a uh, Candesartan and Visoprolol, and he was uh, also uh, treated with uh, low molecular weight heparin because of uh, his uh, myeloma. And uh, the question is, uh, what will be the, the next step with, uh, with this patient? What do we think that uh, we need to, to do is, is enough? We have the right diagnosis, FF is, is okay, for the symptoms and the finding that uh, we, we have uh, in, in the ECHO, or do you think that we need to, to go more in deep and try to have uh, other uh, imaging tests? I don't know if uh, you want to answer this question. What about a cardiac MRI? <laughs> yeah. Our failure with preserved DF and uh, multiple myeloma. Um, yeah, this is a this is a, a really good uh, uh, proposal. In fact, uh, the suspicion of uh, amyloidosis is is not very high. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, echo is not the the right test, but uh, the strain pattern probably is not typical for for amyloidosis. Of course, this do not rule out uh, amyloidosis. And um, another uh, finding that probably is not closely related with amyloidosis is that uh, the, the level of NT proBNP was not very high and in general patients with uh, cardiac amyloidosis have uh, higher levels of 
of BNP. But uh, sure, it's what we did. We did uh, a CAR-TK MRI in order to rule out amyloid doses or to at least have more information about what happened. And uh, uh, the first uh, surprise was uh, to detect uh, a really a large uh, right ventricle with uh, right ventricular dysfunction. Um, T1 and T2 mapping were uh, normal. Uh, Levin de Graeyection fraction was also normal. There are no uh, signs of uh, amyloidosis. But um, the, this cardiac MRI was, uh, was done um, five days after the, the echo, and there, has, there are big differences in the, in the right ventricular function. So this is uh, again another look for the cardiac MRI, and uh, as you can see here, we we found a, a severely depressed right ventricular function, and uh, probably the most important is uh, extra cardiac finding in uh, cardiac imaging techniques in in this case, and. Uh, even if uh, cardiac MRI is not the right tool to perform a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, we found uh, here a pulmonary infarct and even a thrombus in the pulmonary artery. So during this uh, week, uh, the patient deteriorated. He um, deteriorated his uh, functional uh, degree and um, in fact, when after the, this uh, uh, cardiac MRI, we perform a new echo, and this is our first finding in the uh, main pulmonary artery with a thrombus. And uh, the patient, uh, we, we perform also an urgent uh, CPS scan that uh, show a severe pulmonary, bilateral pulmonary embolism. So, um, uh, this is uh, the, the analysis, the blood test that we have uh, uh, yes, uh, after the, the CT scan with the low platelets count and a significant increase in nt bnp and even cardiac troponin when compared with uh, the previous week uh, uh, blood test and um, the diagnosis of severe right ventricular dysfunction. So, Due to the uh, high risk of uh, bleeding associated with thrombopenia, a uh, decision was made to perform a percutaneous thrombectomy with uh, low dose intraarterial fibrinolysis instead of systemic full dose of thrombolysis. And uh, after the procedure, fortunately, the evolution of the patient was very good. And the patient was uh, discharged in a very stable condition with uh, preserved left and also right ventricular function. And uh, probably the, the main problem that we had with this patient is that because the, the first symptom was a short breath with edema, and we are so focused on heart failure diagnosis, we do not uh, um, consider other potential diagnoses. So probably the pulmonary embolism was uh, the reason for dyspnea from the beginning in this patient. And because we do not treat uh, correctly this pulmonary uh, embolism, the uh, patient um, situation uh, deteriorates. But well, this is just uh, uh, what uh, uh, we, we review. Uh, uh, for, for that case. I don't know if you have any additional comment. Hello, Teresa, can you hear me? Hello, Sebastian, how are you? Hello, greetings from Poland. Excellent case, congratulations. I have small comment or question. Uh, when you evaluate the first, uh, the second echo with abnormal GLS, did you evaluate the right ventricular function? Yes, in fact, we, we found a decrease in the right ventricular uh, free wall longitudinal strain when compared to baseline. But, uh, and uh, the, the right ventricle was uh, mild dilated, but there are no signs of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, we interpret this finding in the same context as uh, the decrease in the left ventricular strain. 
Okay, because sometimes my colleague, echo colleague, evaluate GLS in right ventricular, and sometimes the deterioration of right ventricular function predict the um, event associated with pulmonary embolism. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely agree, completely agree. So, in fact, I, I bring these cases because uh, uh, I think that uh, in some in some areas or in some scenarios, we are so focused on heart failure that uh, we we do not consider other a uh, significant problem for cancer patients. And uh, if we are very, very focused on ejection fraction or GLS, and we detect a decrease in GLS with preserved ejection fraction and the patient has symptoms of heart failure, in this case, uh, it, this case was uh, uh, five years, three years ago, but uh, for the first time, we do not consider pulmonary embolism even after uh, taking a, de a decrease in right ventricular function. Yes, yes, and in this way, your case confirm uh, that the process of pulmonary embolism may be very dynamic, and first echo uh, cannot evaluate the exact diagnosis. So we should remember about that, especially in patients receiving carfilzomib with the risk of uh, cardiac left ventricular deterioration pro probability, and uh, this patient receives uh, lenalidomide with high risk of pulmonary embolism. So thank you for this excellent case, very important in clinical, uh, clinical uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Teresa, so, uh, yes? I was going to say, along the lines of looking for outside of just plain old heart failure, what has your experience been with this drug and pulmonary hypertension? Well, we do not have a lot of uh, experience in uh, in that uh, topic. Uh, uh, of course, pulmonary hypertension is uh, closely related with uh, uh, left side heart failure, but in the penalty of uh, heart failure, yes. Uh, pulmonary hypertension as primary finding, we do not have a lot of patients who develop this, this problem uh, without uh, pulmonary embolism. Okay, so um, we move to, to the next uh, case, and uh, this is a case that uh, we, we received, uh, in fact, uh, one week ago. So probably uh, I'm going to need your help uh, to understand what happened with, uh, with uh, this case. This is a 45-year-old female from Thailand uh, with a past history of uh, smoking. And uh, she was diagnosed of lung adenocarcinoma one year ago. And um, a, a, a treatment based on cisplatin, permetrazet, and pembrolizumab was planned and she was included in a clinical trial. So uh, she was randomized to receive uh, lembatinib versus placebo. So in the, the first uh, CT scan that was performed before a randomization, uh, the radiologist detected severe pericardial diffusion and also a thrombosis of uh, the right jugular vein. And uh, the patient was uh, referred for uh, evaluation to, to our. And um, even if the patient was newly is symptom. Sorry about this the audio. I think we just have to be patient. Uh, the 
echo that uh, we have with a severe pericardial effusion that developed in less than two months uh, because uh, the patient has an echo before the diagnosis of uh, lung cancer uh, in relation with a, a single echo. So even if it was not a tonometer, we decided to form a business and so a percutane was to me and this is the first thing. So uh, in general, and uh, she she was again come in, in our clinic. Her resting ECG was uh, normal as well as cardiac training and repeat and no risk factor because uh, he, she has a history of a uh, former smoker, but uh, is the only risk factor. Blood pressure was normal, normal cholesterol, no diabetes, no family history of uh, ischemic heart disease. So we decided uh, to perform a stress test. And um, this is the, the result of the, of the stress test. I don't know why this video doesn't work. But, uh, At baseline, the normal ECG that the virus protocol she developed chest pain. Pain with the significant changes in repolarization in the inferior and lateral area. Blood pressure was uh, quite normal for the stress, and uh, these uh, findings were occur at the end. So, what was uh, your um, next step with the uh, decision? So we decided to perform a cardiac and the most was the absence of circumflex artery. And we also found a non-significant and non-calcified stenosis in the middle segment of the right coronary artery. So it's quite complex to explain this case, but our final diagnosis was vasospasma related to, to the cancer treatment. And uh, we start uh, treatment with nitroglycerin, transdermic nitroglycerin and ablodibium. And uh, this uh, scan was done one week ago. And uh, yesterday the patient came back to, to the clinic and uh, uh, she refers that uh, chest pain uh, has improved after the initiation of, uh, of this treatment. So, well, these are the two cases that uh, I wanted to, to share with you. I have more clinical cases, but I think that it's better to have a short discussion. And, uh, well, my conclusion on how to integrate cardiac imaging in cardiology, that, of course, we need multidisciplinary team work in order to balance the strengths and limitation of different cardiac imaging techniques and uh, in order to choose which is the right technique for the right patient in the right clinical scenario. And of course, uh, to organize the uh, cardiovascular monitoring protocols, we need uh, to take into account uh, baseline cardiovascular risk Well, we may have <clears throat> we may have lost her. <laughs> Sorry about that. She was she was in the hospital and was uh, I think using a hot spot, so we may have lost her. But um, I don't know, Jeannie and Lauren um, and Jennifer. I don't know if y'all want to try to chime in and kind of summarize what she was what she was saying and maybe field some questions. I'll send her a text. 
you know, I just want to make a point with regard to the first case, um, you know, with these cancer in the cancer population, especially multiple myeloma, especially the, the agent, the regimen that that patient was receiving. Essentially, anybody at Memorial who walks through the door that has shortness of breath, and unless there is an obvious reason, these patients get ruled out, the PE gets ruled out. That is kind of one, two, and three under differential. So, um, so it was a great case that was presented that even that um, that PE is definitely very, very high in our uh, differential in this cancer population. And I think that's a that's a great point. And I think also Jeannie touched on it a bit as well, like the question of um, like pulmonary hypertension as well. And you know, like we, you know, Teresa pointed out, and you and Jeannie pointed out you know, we're often the first referral for symptoms of, you know, shortness of breath or something a little abnormal on an echo, even if it's on the right side, um, which is fine and, and appropriate. But I think um, we do cardiac. have to keep, you know, our differential like very wide and not just PE, but, but um, you know, multiple agents that can cause direct pulmonary toxicity. And I think, um, some of us are lucky who work in, you know, with large cancer centers, we have dedicated pulmonologists, you know, just like we're dedicated for cardiac, um, for the oncology patients, they're dedicated for pulmonology. And we um, are very liberal about referring those patients um, in that type of a scenario where it seems like it's not truly maybe um, cardiac dysfunction, but likely a pulmonary etiology. and. Um, we want to do some further, you know, work up uh, PFTs, CT, um, or further advanced, you know, pulmonary testing um, for that. So, um, yeah, I agree with that. I think the, um, you know, we have so many tools in our toolbox to use for imaging, and um, the temptation is to, you know, to use all of them. Um, <laughs> and I do think that, um, you know, I, I think. Imaging is so key to the management of patients that you suspect have toxicities. But I also feel like we we need to, um, you know, in terms of surveillance and whatnot, I think we we really do need to have some outcomes data, and we need to police ourselves a little bit in terms of the appropriate use of imaging. Um, you know, I, I I think down the line um, there'll be some accountability for how we're using imaging and how how much we're using it. So I think that if we have more data to inform which imaging modalities and which scenarios are actually lead to um, you know a change in outcome, um, I think would be really helpful. Great, Teresa's back. <laughs> Teresa's back with us. <laughs> Yes, I'm so sorry because I lose the connection at that hospital, and uh, I finished to to share my my conclusion, but uh, I was uh, alone in uh, in the in the in the room. So uh, not sure if now you are seeing or not uh, my screen. Well, we did see your slides, so that was great. We saw the nice images and the results that you had put on the slides. Um, it's just some of your audio we didn't hear at the end. So feel free to re-summarize or <laughs> mention anything else. Okay, no, well, I think that uh, the, my, my reflection on, on that topic is that uh, uh, when we started to work, at least in La Paz, when we started to work in cardiac oncology many years ago, the main focus on was, was on heart failure. So it seems that say, if you don't have a 3D echo or you don't have a GLS, you are not able to uh, monitor correctly cancer patients. But uh, we also have a lot of information from the clinical evaluation and using other imaging techniques. And uh, I think this is a very important message because in uh, a lot of um, centers, a strain or 3D echo is not always available for um, every cancer patient. And uh, we can also uh, organize a, a good job if we are able to stratify patient's risk and uh, then to select which patient are going to benefit more for advanced cardiac imaging tests during a cancer treatment. And uh, also an, an important message is not just to focus on heart failure because there are other important cardiovascular toxicities and uh, 
pulmonary embolies, more coronary artery disease, or vasos fans, or other vascular toxicities that at the end may even lead to heart failure, but uh, the workflow for diagnosis is completely different. I agree, absolutely. You gotta think about the, you know, generate your top differential, think outside of heart failure, myocarditis, vasospasm, other vascular, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite daunting actually, but, but um, I agree, very complex. I think, um, you know, I also really like the way that you laid out those the um, two cases at the beginning side by side. And I think um, you made a good point that often by kind of just showing the, the EF and the GLS, you know, we're really focused on that, which, you know, is fair and obviously a cornerstone of, of cardio-oncology care. Um, but then I think when you also then laid out afterwards, you know, the age, the risk factors, um, and then even the left bundle, you know, in that other patient, it really highlighted looking at all the cardiovascular risk factors. And um, this is just sort of a point of discussion or a question for the panel. You know, in that patient um, with a history of hypertension, you know, if they were on a different, um, you know, antihypertensive that was not, you know, a beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, ARB, um, would you preemptively consider, since they're already on treatment for hypertension, um, treating with one of, switching over to one of those meds, um, knowing we don't have great data, um, but the patient's gonna be on medication anyways and sort of have a shared decision-making um, type of conversation with the patient about that. Um, I know we're pretty aggressive um, on our end just because there's so many um, things that we, risk factors we cannot modify in patients, um, but hypertension is one that we can. Um, and so we kind of look for an excuse, you know, to put somebody on something or to switch onto something. And what's what's been your experience with those types of patients? I've done exactly that. <laughs> yeah. Is there an amylodipine? I'll switch them over to an ACE inhibitor. You know, I, just, I don't know. I don't know that that's the right thing to do, but mm -hmm. it makes good sense. So, um, yeah, from a practical perspective, I feel like if their ejection fraction is going to decline, they're going to end up on that anyway. So, I may as well start now. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and another problem that uh, we have, and I think that is. Uh, even more frequent now that uh, a few years ago is that uh, in the cardiology area we receive a lot of patients with previous cardiovascular diseases that uh, need cardiotoxic therapies. And uh, also in these patients, uh, ejection fraction is not the only uh, parameter that we need uh, to monitor. And uh, I think you know, I have another, well, it's a very beautiful case. It's not very interesting from the imaging point of view, but uh, I can't, if you want, I can share my, my screen yes, just to to know your, your opinion about uh, this uh, case. Are you able to see my screen now? Yep. Now we see yes, it. Yes or not? Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. So this is a this is a young uh, woman with uh, breast cancer. And uh, this is the baseline echo when the, uh, she was referred for, for the first uh, evaluation. And uh, as you can see, there is a significant mitral valve uh, prolapse. And um, in fact, uh, cardiac function was normal, left ventricle, right ventricle, all was normal. But uh, the patient has a severe prolapse of the mitral valve, a severe asymptomatic mitral regurgitation. And uh, the oncologist wanted to start uh, anthracyclines and then testusumab. So um, in this kind of patient, you prefer to send the patient to the operating room and then to start cancer therapy, or you, in this case, the patient was asymptomatic and there are no additional criteria for mental intervention in our in our test. What could be your decision? That's a tough one because yeah, um, yeah that's a tough one. We we have um, had a discussion regarding this, um, and I think you kind of have to 
somewhat do a case by case. Um, in someone who's totally asymptomatic, um, you know, e even though their GLS and EF may be normal, you know, you have to wonder whether the protoplasm is not quite normal in somebody with severe mitral regurgitation. However, if you do subject them to, I guess, if, I guess part of it, it also depends on whether we can get away with a clip percutaneously, or do you have to actually go in with a, you know, open repair? Um, because one of the things that our breast oncologists will often tell us is that they can't wait that long. So it's it's a risk benefit. So I think that, um, you know, if if the patient, if, if we can get away with a clip um, and patient can have pretty speedy recovery, I may consider that route. But if not, then I probably would just watch the patient like a hawk and let them do their, and get them started on their treatment. <laughs> So in, in, in this case, uh, the, the patient was completely asymptomatic. Of course, the, well, the baseline strain was uh, was abnormal, as uh, you can see here, that uh, the rest of parameters were very close to normality, except pulmonary wow. uh, systolic artery pressure. So we have here two uh, big issues or to think uh, to to move to the to the surgery before a uh, nice. cancer treatment but uh, um the patient uh, do not want uh, to to operate a uh, heart mitral valve and uh, we perform a stress test in this case the functional degree was completely normal with a uh, have functional class one and uh, we we decided to to start a cancer treatment with a very very close follow-up of uh, this uh, patient and uh, uh, we start also treatment with a uh, candesartan of course this is not big evidence but based on the prada trial to, to protect or to try to minimize uh, the risk of uh, cardiovascular uh, problems and um, he develops uh, atrial fibrillation uh, uh, at the end of anticycline therapy so and heart failure and uh, in that moment we we decided to uh, delay treatment with uh, a and uh, the patient was referred for mitral valve repair. These are well, nice imaging with a new uh, software that uh, is able to display minor details of, of, the, of the mitral valve. It's just a picture. And um, after the surgery, we are restarted to student therapy and well, the patient is now is in a good condition. And uh, it seems that uh, is um, without uh, uh, any signs of uh, breast cancer uh, progression. Wow, yeah, it's that, these are really tough questions. Can I ask, um, I, um, Teresa and the panel, um, you showed um, the first case, and, and I think the second case as well, RV strain. Is that something that you've been doing routinely, clinically, and how, are you, and, and, um, um, and how does that? Well, I guess it's a. Do you, and do you use that as a as a as an assessment of RV function, systolic function? We do not use uh, right ventricular strain routinely uh, for a clinical decision making. Of course, we we try to analyze right ventricular strain, and we started to do that. Uh, uh, last year, because uh, we received well a specific software that is focused on the, on right ventricular strain, so it's automatically done, and uh, we started to to collect data, but uh, with different uh, decision, just based on right ventricular strain from now. We are also not doing it regularly. I think it's great potential. I think it's great that you're gathering data and others should probably do the same. And we've started looking at it. Um, and um, and like you said, I think that if you, you know, with experience and the right software is actually fairly not very challenging to do. And I think, you know, RV size and function has been the albatross of 2D echo. And um, so sure. anything that we could, any, any additional, you know, um, um, methods that we can do to better assess RV would be, I think, very helpful. And this is where we go to cardiac MR, you know, anytime that we can, you know, assess, you know, like that first case that you presented only showing some subtle, and whether, whether the RV abnormality was 
actually there or not is questionable. That first case you presented, but certainly MR is, oh, you know, you, it's like you can see it's so, so much better and evaluate so much uh, more closely. So this is uh, Josh Mitchell at Washington University. We started doing a strain on all of our patients a few years ago under the direction of our ECHO director, Julio Perez. And in that, we've also done RV strain, and we do it on almost every patient. I would say that clinically, it's one data point, so I use it when I'm reading echoes in conjunction with TAPC or RVS Prime. I haven't found yet on my reading of echoes that it's broken the case open where everything else was normal, and then the RV strain told me what was going on. But I do find that, you know, doing it on every patient, that it is just an additional data point to know if there's anything that seems wrong with how the RV is functioning. Good to know. Yeah. No, I I fully really agree that this is a really useful tool for evaluating right ventricle. The problem is that if in a patient under, I don't know, cycling or, or just choose a map, uh, we, we did, you detect a, a decrease in right ventricular strain that uh, left ventricular strain was normal and there are no increase in cardiac troponin. I suppose that this is not a standard case, but uh, you think that uh, yes, because of uh, a decrease in right ventricular strain, you need uh, to organize in a different way the, the monitoring of this patient? I don't think we have any data, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. That's why uh, yeah, we, we, need to, we, we need more data and probably we need to, to collect data to understand because there are um, preliminary publications that uh, uh, refer that a decrease in, in right ventricular strain goes at the same time as the decrease in uh, left ventricular uh, strain. So probably uh, it's more easy to find both uh, uh, problems at the same time. But, uh, we do not have experience in, in that topic. Or even if it does appear uh, occur earlier, uh, there was a, a study that um, using 3D in anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity, suggesting that RV the abno impaired RV strain may occur earlier than LV strain. But whether intervening intervening impacts on outcome, you know, that's a huge question mark. I was curious, Teresa, you know, that case that you presented, that, that mitral valve case, um, in general, what is the practice um, in, um, um, in your hospital where the oncologist would feel comfortable? Where, when, when, how long do you have to wait after open heart surgery before you can resume the treatment? Well, it's difficult to, to, to give an answer for all patients. In this case, this uh, patient, uh, the, the recovery was very fast uh, after surgery, and in six weeks, he, he restarted testosterone therapy. But in general, oncologists prefer to not to operate patients uh, during uh, cancer therapy, sure. And uh, uh, in... We, we have another another patient that was uh, diagnosed uh, of a breast cancer also with a severe mitral regurgitation due to a rheumatic uh, mitral valve disease. And um, we decided to perform the operation before uh, the treatment of uh, breast cancer. And it takes a lot of time to recover from the, from the surgery, with the complex surgery, with prothesis, and uh, the patient suffer several infection in the yeah. first day after the surgery. So if it is possible and the patient is asymptomatic and there are no very high risk of decompensation, I think that oncologists prefer to, to go ahead with their cancer treatment and try to delay um, surgery. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of cases uh, to, to make this complex decision. So, it's Joe Carver, I've been trying to jump in for a few general comments. Um, I think for the last, the last question, which is really important, um, a lot has to do with what the chemotherapy is, whether or not, whether or not there's going to be cytopenias and mm -hmm. infection. So, mm -hmm. uh, like most of the other things that you've said today, a lot of these decisions are individual based on multiple factors and not just a one statement that 
you could do surgery and that's our chemotherapy X number of weeks here. That's it depends on the aggressiveness of the tumor and what, you know, what the oncologic is. I just want to say a couple of, of, of things about uh, that was discussed before. The, uh, I always like to just reinforce that cancer patients get cardiac symptoms and disease that has nothing to do with their cancer and, and the treatment. So you have to just keep that in mind and not blame everything on, on chemotherapy. And that uh, uh, the question about the blood pressure thing is, I mean, that's the reason that we exist. There's a regular cardiologist would say your blood pressure is controlled get chemotherapy. Um, I think our role is to say, if you want to take a drug, you want to get some cardiac, cardiac uh, protection from the medicine, even if it's not improved, it didn't really get help, but it's basically better than just taking something that we know goes on make a difference. So I think that's 100%. And I don't think I've ever had anybody used to do that and explain it because give them some protection and makes their chemotherapy safer. And then uh, the question of cardiac interventions and uh, you know, cancer, uh, I always take a step back and say, what would I do and how would I manage this patient if they didn't have cancer? This is sort of the first starting point. Um, because if you aren't going to do anything anyhow, uh, I think that, that that makes it easier to discuss to make a decision about, about what to do when when you when you get treated for cancer. That's all. I mean, if it works. May I? Sure. I have a question. Uh, sure. This is. Uh, Agnese Maria Fioretti, Bari Cancer Institute, Italy. Congratulations to Dr. Lopez Fernandez. You are really keen and brilliant, and I uh, follow your job. Uh, my question is about uh, um, cardio oncological surveillance. Uh, in this period of pandemic, uh, maybe uh, we uh, should prefer cardiac biomarkers uh, instead of uh, um, imaging tools. Uh, GLS is a very favorable um, technique, but it is time consuming. Here in Italy, we uh, medical doctors perform echocardiography. We don't have um, sonographers. So uh, for which patients uh, do you suggest me uh, to perform a GLS? Uh, when is it a must, apart from uh, anthracyclines and anti- uh, her two drugs. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very important question, and uh, for sure, all of us we are affected by pandemic and sometimes by low availability of uh, some uh, imaging techniques. Well, I have two comments. First, uh, that uh, with the current subworld, uh, really we do not spend a lot of time to quantify strain because is it possible to quantify strain when the patient uh, has gone home? And uh, in fact, with new software, it takes uh, less than one minute to quantify strain. It's not the same as a few years before. But uh, sure, the, I think that the strain is, is a must uh, at baseline in patients with low normal ejection fraction because, uh, for example, in Jan, people uh, with uh, lymphomas or breast cancer, uh, sometimes we detect a low normal ejection fraction, but the strain was completely normal. And this is a common finding in, in Jan people or even in athletes. And um, if at baseline strain is uh, under normal uh, values, and you have a patient with other comorbidities, you, even with preserved ejection fraction, you need to organize a close monitoring for these patients. And um, during the therapy, I think that most of the information we have is uh, using anthracycline and trastuzumab, but uh, probably we also have uh, information regarding the use of a strain in patients treated with uh, PKI. There are very 
uh, recent information about the use of a strain in patients treated with immunotherapy, but uh, probably there is no much uh, information in, in that topic. I don't know what is the opinion of uh, the rest of the panel. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent what you said. I think that the really the role of strain that I think that we all can agree upon is that it's, it's a higher reproducibility, it is more accurate than e ejection fraction. And the role that I think strain plays the most, in my opinion, right now, is that it, it is just more accurate than ejection fraction. We know that if EF is 60 or greater, the LV systolic function is all likelihood normal. Is where, and if it's less than 50, in all likelihood is abnormal. It's in that gray zone where it's kind of low normal, lower limit of normal, where strain could really have added value. And and yes, I do agree that it does take extra time and, and but practice does make it you know easier. Uh, I agree again with Teresa that that once you get it down, it really does take probably you know less than you know three minutes. I don't know about less than one minute, but maybe less than three minutes in our lab. Um, so it is um it, it it can be done pretty you know pretty easily, but it's really in that low normal range where strength can be super helpful. I'll just kind of echo and chime in about um, your last comment, Teresa, about the immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, cardiotoxicity, and myocarditis. Um, and um, yeah, I think we all have seen now in multiple studies that at least half, if not more, of patients have a preserved um, left ventricular ejection fraction who clinically have some uh, varying level of a, a myocarditis or cardiotoxicity type presentation. Um, and those uh, patients have been shown, you know, with a preserved EF um, to have abnormal strain by echo. Um, you know, abnormal, of course, in those with a depressed EF as well, but but still abnormal in those with a preserved EF. And, um, you know, with Tom Nealon, his group showed that that was predictive of major adverse cardiovascular events. So I think um, there is value in that. And of course, you know, we could talk about the value of cardiac MR in, in the setting of myocarditis, and that uh, would definitely indicate it as well. Um, but even, for example, in our study looking at um, ICI myocarditis, um, and we looked at uh, strain by cardiac MR, we had similar results where 50% of patients had a preserved EF by cardiac MR, um, but all patients had decreased um, strain by MR strain, um, including, you know, specifically those with a preserved EF as well. So I think it just really highlights uh, the utility of seeing some early, um, you know, dysfunction, not only subclinical, but in patients that had clinical uh, cardiotoxicity, you know, at the time. So. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you all for your presentation. Thanks to our imaging working group here for uh, presenting as a team. Thank you, Teresa, for a wonderful presentation. And we'll we'll have one more of these uh, next month. Our imaging group will present another another discussion. So thank you everybody for joining, and thank you all for your presentation. And we'll uh, see you next week, hopefully. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.